Good evening. I'm so glad we had so many people uh, to join us here tonight. Um, we expected even more. We had a lot of cancellations with the weather, but uh, there are people now watching us on TV or on their computers. So let me start by uh, expressing my gratitude to Ken, who has been a supportive and encouraging colleague to me for almost 30 years. Um, Dr. Kenneth J. Doka is our longtime professor of gerontology, and he immediately said yes when we asked if he would provide us some wisdom and guidance in this difficult time. In addition to being one of our most famous professors, Ken is also a senior consultant at Hospice of America, Hospice Foundation of America, and a prolific author. One book I would like to mention tonight is entitled Grief is a Journey, Finding Your Path Through Loss. Ken firmly believes that there is no one-size-fits-all way to cope with loss. The vital bonds that we form in life continue long after they are broken. Dr. Doka will share encouraging stories of individuals all working through unique losses. In doing so, he will help us to realize that our experiences following a death or a loss are far more individual and much less predictable. Dr. Doka also teaches how to cope with disenfranchised grief. That is the type of loss that is not so readily recognized or supported by society. These include non-fatal losses like divorce, the end of a friendship, losing a job, or the end of a very special institution. Since no two people experience grief in the exact same way, I know he will give us a few strategies for managing our path forward. Ken, thank you so very much for your willingness to help us with this loss of the College of New Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's good to be here. I was going to start out by talking about the title and franchising grief, but um, thank you for doing that already. So I can move on. Um, yeah, I, I, I think like everybody in the audience, I have highly ambivalent emotions as I, I stand here and talk about the grief over losing our college. And I know probably many of you in, in, in the group share it. Um, a number of years ago, um, probably about, you know, I've, I've been in the field of grief and loss for 48 years. I try to tell people I was six when I started, but nobody believes that anymore. Um, but when I was uh, probably about 40 years ago, um, and I had done academic presentations and I had done scholarly presentations, um, I was asked to, uh, by a funeral home in, in Astoria, where I was living at the time and where I grew up, um, to do a presentation to their, their clients, their grieving families. Um, so they sent out an invitation to people who had had a death within the past year. And I went there, um, and, um, and I remember my feeling at the time, I, as I said, I had done you know, presentations before, I was even teaching. But this seemed to be quite a different situation to talk to a bunch of people who were in the middle of grief. Uh, you know, it's one thing to do theory, it's another thing to deal with reality. Um, and I was very, very nervous. Um, probably about the same nervousness I have tonight as I speak with you. Um, and at the end of the night, we had an you know, we asked people to do an evaluation. And I very anxiously looked at the evaluations to see how the program had come off. And I never forgot what one people wrote. You know, talked about what, what did you like about the presentation, what were the limitations of the presentation. And one woman wrote under it, it didn't bring my husband back. And I thought that was such a powerful statement. I never forgot that whenever I do a presentation of this nature. You know, really the only answer to, to loss, uh, the only magic in loss is if you could bring that person back, if you could bring that institution back. And, and obviously we come here today really uh, not to do that, but in many ways for awake. And, um, and, and you know, and, and I always think that, you know, there's nothing I can say that can take away the pain and the hurt that many of us has experienced and the loss that many of us are experiencing as, as, we, um, as we consider this and look at this. Um, 
but I do think we can do something. And, and a couple of students taught me that a number of years ago. Um, the first student I'll call Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen was the kind of graduate student you love to have. Um, in the sense that she, you know, she loved learning and she loved to come to your office and, you know, and every Monday when I taught the course, um, I, I could always count on her dropping in before the course and asking about something she had read or wanting to talk about something she had read. Wonderful, wonderful student. And soon after the course had ended, um, her brother died, her 30-year-old brother died in a car crash. And I went to the funeral. I found out about it. I went to the funeral. Uh, and when I gave my condolences to Mary Ellen, she said, you know, it's been interesting. Um, I loved your course on, on grief, uh, grief, mourning, and bereavement. And she said, and I would talk about it with all my friends uh, all the time. She says, I probably bored the hell out of them. And she said, and a number of people came up to me at the funeral and said, did the course help? And she said, I had to think about it. And she said, when I thought about it, my answer was, it didn't make it any easier. You know, it didn't make my feelings any easier. It just made them more understandable. And I think that's what we can do in sessions like this. Not, there's nothing I can say that can take away the hurt, the pain, uh, the loss. But we can make it more understandable. I learned that from a second student who was probably very much unlike Mary Ellen. Uh, I'll call this guy Sidney, and Sidney was a student. Remember, I started at the College of New Rochelle uh, at 33, uh, teaching graduate students, many of whom were quite older. And Sidney was well in his 50s. And he would sit in the back and just kind of look at me, um, never spoke. I had this theory that you know he was uh, kind of thinking, well, what is this young kid going to teach me? Um, and. Um, you know, and he wasn't a student, he was a student very much unlike Mary Ellen in that way. And then one day, as we were talking, uh, not even in a death and dying course, we were talking in an aging family course about widows and widowers. Um, you know, I was talking about grief and the individuality of grief and our own individual timetables. And all of a sudden, Sidney's hand shot up and he said, are you saying it takes more than a year to get through a loss? Um, you know, and I have to tell you, I always tell my graduate students, you know, you always have a right to challenge me, you always have a right to look for research, but you're not always happy when it happens. Uh, you know, it's not always as, as fun as it, as it sounds. So, you know, so I, I looked at Sydney and I said, yeah, there's, there's no timetable, there's no, no this, there's no that. And Sydney said, do you have proof of that? And I was a little bit intimidated and I said, yeah. Um, and he said, can I see that on Thursday? That was the next day of our class. We met on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now I would say, no, I'll tell you where it is. It's your job. <laughs> you know, uh, but I was, I was taken back and I was a little bit intimidated, so I said, yeah. And so you know, that next day I put together a, a manila folder through, of, of studies. I was going to show them that I really knew what I ta was talking about. Uh, and when Sydney came into my office, which was in those days in the old library, um, I basically, probably pretty rudely, just you know, threw him this folder and said, here's the studies you asked for. Uh, and he thanked me and left. And then as I'm coming downstairs in the library, I was on the third floor of the old library. Second floor was the base of the library, and that's where the copying machines were. And I see Sidney making multiple copies of some of my studies, some of the studies I gave him. And you know how you think it's always about you? <laughs> So I thought, is, is he making a complaint? Is he using these studies as evidence? You know, what's going on? So I said, Sydney, is everything OK? And he said, oh, he said, uh, you're probably wondering what I'm doing. You know, I was very cool. I said, no, not really, but if you want to tell me. <laughs> and he said, um, what you said the other day really struck me. He said, I, I know I don't talk in class. He said, I'm really nervous in class because, you know, I've been so long since I finished college. And he said, um, but, he said, when you, he said, but you, so I don't tell my story very much. He said, but my wife and I ran a dress business together. We had a dress store together. And I loved working with her. And, you know, and everybody tells you don't work with your spouse, you know. He says, for us, it worked wonderfully. Uh, and then she died. And she said, I couldn't take the business anymore because it wasn't my business, it was our business. And once she left, it wasn't 
it wasn't my business. It was, you know, her, her ghost haunted it. He said, but, um, he said, and my friends have been wonderful. He said, every, you know, they constantly invite me for dinner. They, you know, they constantly invite me out. They've been really loyal and wonderful. Now, you know, Sydney was Jewish, and in the Jewish tradition, often they have what they call the unveiling or the dedication of the memorial stone. It doesn't have to be, but it's usually at the one year anniversary of the death. And he said, and after the unveiling, and in Sydney's case it was, he said, they would still invite me for dinner, but there would always be a single woman seated alongside of me. <laughs> and they kept saying, Sydney, it's time. Uh, it's been a year. Miriam wouldn't want you to, you know, to, uh, to, to stay single. You're, you know, you're a re relatively young man. You're very successful. You're educated. You're a good catch. It's time to start dating. And he said, no, I couldn't function. I had no interest. I, I couldn't function on these dates. I, I, you know, I just, I just didn't want to be there. And they kept saying, Sydney, you've got to seek help. There's something wrong with you. And he said, I began to believe them. He said, and when you said that in class the other day, he said it was like a weight was lifted from my shoulders. And he, he, said, he said, this burden was lifted. And I kept saying to myself, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just grieving. He said, so I'm making copies of these studies to send to my friends. <laughs> and I thought that was a great gift. And I think that's what we can do tonight. We can't make it any easier, but we can maybe validate what you're experiencing and give you, as Brenner suggested, some ideas of some of the things that can help us cope. Um, and, um, oops. Well, let's use this. I'll try again. Now, let's. I'll, I'll. Okay, what do we do here? Oh, okay. Why are we closing out again? I, what happened here? <laughs> oh, something happened, and now the computer wants to restart. Okay. Okay, that's not good. All right. Um, just give us a second here for technical things. That's, it's going to be a couple minutes. <laughs> so anyway, um, trying to think of where we are. Um, <coughs> that's the trouble with PowerPoint. You get so used to it. <laughs> you get, you get kind of dependent and tongue-tied when it's not operating. Is it restarting? The yeah, computer's restarting. Okay. Tell the computer to behave. Okay. Well, anyway, let me go on. Um, what I was going to say is, you know, really there's a very simple formula. And the formula is that whenever you have an attachment, an attachment to anything, and you have a loss, what happens is grief. And for some of us, you know, I've been here for 38 years, you get very attached not just to people, but to places and to things and the like. Um, a number of years ago, the Hospice Foundation sent me to the Red River when the Red River flooded. That's the trouble of working for a grief organization. You get sent to, to the oddest places at the most unusual times. But anyway, I was, I was at the Red River, and one of, the, one, of the, one of the women I counseled, and the Red River was interesting because the flood, which was awful, horrific, of what they called a 500-year flood, you know, just really covered the town of North Forks, was so awful that, uh, but it was predictable. So no lives were lost, but lots of property was, was lost. And one of the most profound grief cases I had was a woman whose family had come from Germany a number of generations ago who had lost, they had these hand-carved Christmas ornaments that had been 200 years old. And each year it had been a tradition in the family when some couple married out of the family, they would get one of these, you know, one of these ornaments. And so when these ornaments were swept away in the flood, this woman had a sense of horrific loss. Um, that, you know, that not only had, had she lost something ab about herself, but she had lost, um, why don't you just put in your own name? So I don't have to worry about that and, and, and cue in. Um, and do you need this? Or will you think it'll stay? 
in any case, um, she had felt she had, she had, you know, not only lost something for herself, but she had lost a legacy. Um, she had lost something for generations. Uh, she had betrayed generations before uh, and disappointed generations ahead. And I thought about that woman a lot as I prepared this lecture, because I think in many ways that may be how we feel. This had been, you know, I have, this college is what, 115 years old? Um, and I realized I've been here about a third of it. You know, 38 years. And, you know, and it's an incredible sense of loss on so many levels. You know, it's interesting, we, we often, one of the reasons I wrote Disenfranchised Grief was that we often believed that uh, we began to equate grief with death. And it was never meant to be equated with that. Grief is about loss. It's interesting, you know how Freud started his papers with a case study? Um, the field of grief and loss is about 100 years old. It, uh, we credit it to Freud's paper in 1919 on mourning and melancholia. Um, interesting paper, one of the first psychological papers on grief. You know what Freud's case study was? Anybody want to guess? You might think a spouse, a widow or widower. You might think a parent who lost a child or a child who lost a parent. Yeah? It was a bride abandoned at the altar. And I think the lesson he was giving us was grief is about loss. Not about death, but about loss. And when you're experiencing loss, losses can be both tangible, and I'm sure many of us are experiencing tangible losses here. Uh, many of my, you know, I, I made the decision to retire this year. Um, in many ways because of pressure from my son who kept saying, you know, come on, you can't keep doing a three hour commute every day. Um, so, um, so I made the decision to retire, but so many of my colleagues have potentially lost jobs, uh, potentially lost salaries, you know, all these really tangible losses. And think about the losses that some of you are experiencing. This has been a place for you, uh, a place with, with memories and, and that's all going to change. And then the intangible things like those memories. You know, um, and then we have what we call secondary losses. And losses that are secondary are losses that come as a result of our primary loss. So you know, think of all the secondary losses you experience. And I'm going to ask you about some of those in a minute. But, you know, but for example, uh, a good example of secondary losses, one that resonated with me, is a number of years ago, when my son was 16, he's um, how old is he now? He's 46. Uh, and so when, when, when he was 16, 30 years ago, I was counseling a woman whose 19-year-old son had died of a brain aneurysm. And she said something that really threw me. She said, not only did I lose my son, but I simultaneously lost all of his friends. You know, I never thought about that. And then I think about all the kids that go through our house. You know, my son's friends who, you know, uh, you know, would stay over, sleep over, you know, uh, uh, I'd find them in the kitchen for foraging through our refrigerator. <laughs> and now we're another generation away. And my grandkid, you know, we have a pool. So, you know, it's not unusual for me to come home and see a whole bunch of bicycles in my driveway and then see my granddaughter's friends at 13 or my grandson's friends at 16. Do we need a password? It just, it's, it's not communicating with the network for some reason, so he's, he's trying to figure it out. Uh, 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 we have anything sorry. on there? I'm sorry? Can anybody get in this? We, we can't even get in with our, uh, with our admin uh, account, so he's looking into it right now. Um, can we get another computer that I can just use to, for my own notes? Please, yeah, we're looking into it right now. Okay, looking into it is not really the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. We're working on it. Uh, okay. Working on it is not quite the answer. Um, okay. Um, you know, I need to access my notes. I think I'm doing pretty well without them right now, but uh, <laughs> I mean, at least in terms of knowing where I was going. You suffered a loss. You suffered another loss. Good example of a secondary loss. The technology doesn't work. But my question to you would be, 
what kinds, you know, so losses can be tangible, they can be intangible. They, and, and as I said, some of these losses can be secondary. In other words, they can follow other kinds of losses. Um, you know, so they cascade, really. So my question is, as you sit here today, what are some of the losses that you're thinking of as you experience the closing of our college? What does it mean to you? What are some of the losses that you're experiencing? I'd love people to comment. Please. Community. Yeah. yeah. That's one of my losses, too. You know, people like Sue I've worked with for a number of years uh, are going to be scattered. Others. Spiritual development. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. Ah, at least I've got something here. Um, help me with this. Uh, yeah, yeah. How do we get this to run? Oh, it's not going to run there because it's not on the network. Okay, it's but on another computer. yeah, but how can we? Um, you want to put it on? I want to play it. Yeah, I want to be able to change it. Oh, good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So we said losses can be tangible or intangible. We were talking about secondary losses. So some of you said you were talking about spiritual development. What does that mean? To work on spiritual development. Yeah, yeah. And certainly, spirituality has been a very important part of this place. Uh, and one that I relished. Uh, hey. Okay. Well, you want to see the slides you missed, right? <laughs> this mine? You can, uh, just use the keyboard. Okay. <laughs> I stepped on something here, and it just... Okay. Just put his laptop so you can see Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's just leave it with the, uh, just with the laptop then. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. I'm sorry. You can't see the slides. Sorry. Mm. I carefully constructed these slides. Let me try it. Let me try it. Okay. So, so we're talking about secondary losses. I'm sorry. And, the, you know, I, uh, one thing that Brenner didn't mention is that I'm also a Lutheran clergyman. But I've always found a spiritual home here. I've always found the college so welcoming. As a matter of fact, when, um, when I first applied for a position, I was interviewed by Sister Dorothy Ann Kelly. Um, and one of the things she asked is, would you like to be active in ministry here? Uh, you know, it was a warm welcome for somebody from a different faith tradition. And I always found that was one of the best and nicest things about CNR. It was a place that was spiritually open. So that's a loss. Um, other things that people want to say, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of things that I had never seen before. And it just seems such a tragedy that uh, all of that uh, is gone. That people didn't realize it and do something about it before it got this far. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk about that too, you know, in a minute. Terrible. Yeah. Other comments? Ma'am. Um, not only did it start a great career for myself, but she got married here. So oh, okay. <laughs> And it's still held. <laughs> First marriage I ever did as a Lutheran minister, they came back on different planes from their honeymoon. <laughs> True story. Next one was more successful. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, again, all those, please. Your sense of identity. Yes. Yeah. I lost my home. I grew up here. My mother graduated from here. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing Marionette puppet show over um, one of the halls here, this old theater. I came for every straw fest. I came for every mall night visitor. I came for every um, activity that I could ever come. 
can you take it to the beginning? Yeah. So it's a major loss. Please. The beauty of this space. Yeah. The grounds. I don't know what will happen to it, but it's a beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we've experienced loss in so many ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so we've all experienced losses, and because we've experienced losses, um, we experience grief. And and you know, and part of it is just to acknowledge and recognize the grief experiences that you might be having. Uh, grief. You know, we often think of grief as sadness, but in matter of fact, that's Webster's dictionary: grief, a great sadness. But in reality, grief is far more complex than that. It affects us physically. How many of you, as you dealt with this loss, have had visceral physical reactions to it? You know, your stomach's upset, you have headaches. Yeah. yeah. Chest pains. Anybody else? Tears. Tears. Yeah, we're going to come to behavior. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just want to say something. You know, I'm going to say something. Um, <laughs> it's, it's more of losing a tradition yeah. and a connection. Yeah. I'm the ninth person in my family graduating from this college. Wow. So you think about when I was here coming on campus in the Bronx, I was in the sixth grade. I'm 52 now. Mm -hmm. you know, so you realize that every connection that you made, this is one thread that then became this blanket of hope. Yeah. It's just being scattered. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think also that it's coupled with anger. And yeah. Yeah. Why it was allowed to happen, why did it happen, when it happened to this beautiful place. And so I think that, that is different. Yeah, it's part of grief. You know, when we talk about the emotions of grief, one of the major ones is, is anger. Um, the actual term bereaved comes from a Latin root, which is best, is, which means to have something ripped away from you. You know, um, we're you know about the same generation, and you know you remember the '70s expression to be ripped off. That's what grief is. Grief is being ripped off, and when you're ripped off, anger is a natural response to that. Something that was dear to us, um, something that was important to us, something that we were attached to, that we were invested in, has been taken away. And so, if you're experiencing anger, you know, um, figure out how you you know that's an, a normal, natural reaction. Uh, two loss. It's one of the ones we don't talk about. Yeah. I just want to say I hear everything you're saying. Complete, complete agreement. So many of us here are suffering. Let's be real. We're suffering. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of death and grief and suffering a loss, most times in life, the, those things are not preventable. Mm -hmm. This is a situation that and could have been prevented. Yeah. And, and that, that's where the anger comes in. Yeah. It's not just the grief. Well, you know, part of, yeah, I mean, part of it is that, you know, grief, you know, one of the, one of the aspects of grief is preventability. You know, that obviously you respond differently when there are losses that you think, you know, just are natural. 99-year-old person dies. Not that it makes it any easier in some ways, you know, because... Um, I always remember somebody who said, you know, when somebody, uh, a, a person told me that when their mother died at 101, somebody said, what did you expect? And the answer she gave was very wise. Um, I expected her to live forever because <laughs> she had been part of my life forever. Uh, you know, so, but some losses are, you know, preventable. And when they're preventable, that does, in fact, complicate our grief and often generate, you know, in some cases, guilt, in some cases, anger. Um, so I can understand that, and I, and, I, and I know we deal with that. 
Yeah. For me, it's having blessed my job as one of the first ones to lose my job, um, which is kind of sense of flaws and sense of my identity. Mm -hmm. The second time around is intense. It's more intense than the first one. Really, this time? Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, and I know all the secondary losses you experienced, you know, the cleaning our lunch crowd. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, and again, how we think, uh, how many of you have found it harder to focus? Yeah. Me, as somebody who's currently still in classes, I find myself not caring anymore. Yeah. And fighting... The fighting apathy. Yeah, fighting the need to be like, these classes still matter. I'm here for a reason. I need to move forward to still transfer and to do, accomplish my goals because the plan I had created, the the skills I was going to acquire and why I came here is no longer happening. Mm -hmm. And I was thrown into limbo. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Very sorry about that. Somebody else had a hand up here? Please. Yeah, and that's shared by faculty as well. You know, we were, we were uh, kept in the dark. And I think many staff members here were as well. Please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, one of the biggest losses is the connection, the real connection with your science. Yeah. With whom I have been associated with about 75 years. I worked in the castle for many years. I was intimately involved with the lives of mm. the Yeah, yeah. Please. It's, uh, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, you know, and I really haven't thought much much about it, but the first eight years of my marriage was spent in this school. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife and I, we graduated together, undergraduate and the master's program. And it, it's really hard to think about it. Yeah, yeah. It's so connected, you know, all those losses. Please. Do you have your hand up, sir? Yeah. No. Uh, no, I did, but since you called. Okay. <laughs> Ma'am, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you can't see with the lights here. It's, uh, it's been, lately it's been difficult. You know, I graduate, I uh, worship here in the chapel. I'm on the alumni board. So I, I'm very involved. Mm. So just even here is a connection. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Please. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, sometimes when there is a death, um, families will have a celebration of life. Are they planning on doing anything like as closure for all of us alumni that we can come together and just, you know, celebrate a great time? Um. I'm going to make a recommendation to that effect in a few minutes. I mean, we because. We discussed it. We did discuss it. We didn't have any Yeah. Because one of the things that I, that I will say here, and I'll say it a little bit later on, is that one of the ways that helps us deal with loss is ritual. And I think, you know, we do need some kind of a ritual that allows us to, you know, to, um, you know, and, and I always say funerals shouldn't be a celebration, they should be a, a kind of dual ceremony. You know, one of our theories of grief now is what we call the dual process theory of grief. In that we, you know, grieving involves two separate sets of processes. One is um, acknowledging our loss, and the other is adjusting to a life that's changed by loss. In many ways, you know, funeral rituals have the same role. Um, we both have to mourn a loss, and at the same point in time celebrate a life. And we have to veer between the two of those, you know, oscillate between the two of those. And I think we need some kind of ritual that allows us to do that, that allows us both to acknowledge our loss as we coming together tonight, but also to celebrate the history. And it was a great history. 
uh, of who we are and what we are and what we did as, as college. Um, so we grieve. And, um, you know, and again, we've talked about the dual process and we talked about the fact that each of us is going to do this individually. You know, so you may turn to a friend who's really, well, you know, colleges go and come and go. Uh, and, you know, and that may be their way of dealing with it. Uh, we may have a very different way of dealing with it, you know. So again, some of the good days are predictable, some of them are not. We're all going to grieve in our own different way. We're all grieving the loss of a different institution. I say that when kids lose a parent. We've all lost a different person, haven't we? Even when you're brothers and sisters. Uh, my brother's 13 years older than I am. Uh, he, he died a few years, uh, died about a year and a half ago. And, um, and we never really knew each other well as kids because um, when I was three years old, he was off to the Navy um, at 16, you know. Um, so, you know, as, as we got older, we began to talk more. Um, and, and I remember one time, you know, and you have to remember, he was the son of a couple that had just gotten married in their teens. And I was the son of a middle-aged couple who were more established. And when I hear him talk about his childhood, I said, you, you sure we grew up in the same family? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, he, and, and, you know and, and, and there's a truth to that. You know, we, we all grow up in different families, even as siblings, you know, be, because of our place in the family, because of, you know, where our birth order is, because of our own personality. Um, you know, um, my brother used to have epic fights. I still remember them when he came back from the Navy with my father. I mean, epic, you know. Um, um, we've rarely fought because, uh, you know, I... I um, you know, an example was if, if my brother was told not to hang out with somebody, he would find that, you know, that would be a tremendous affront to him and he'd end up arguing about it. And I would logically look at my father and say, Dad, we can play this two ways. Um, do you want me to hang out with the person and not tell you? Uh, or do you want to know where I am? <laughs> and he would look at me and say, I can't talk to you anywhere. Uh, and then just go away. Uh, but it worked, you know, with different, different situations. Um, so there's no timetable. Most of us find that for most people, over time, pain lessens. And whatever reactions you have are likely to be less. But there's always going to be those surges of grief. You know, that's in any situation. Um, you know, that it may be when you recognize this is your 50th, this would be your 50th reunion year. And even if, you know, Mercy is having something for us or, you know, with us, it's still different. And that may be a time when you say, wow, I, you know, I really miss the college at this moment. And that's very natural and that's very normal that we're going to have, you know, even over the years, even as that pain lessens, these, these surges may still, still occur. Um, you know, um, we always have a bond. And that's the price of the bond. We never lose that connection. And because of that, there may be moments when we're going to experience that pain again. That's very normal and natural. Um, you know, uh, an, I have a number of godchildren. A number of years ago, um, uh, my, one, one of my godsons' father died the day before his fourth birthday. Uh, and so, you know, and I'm half, I, I have a strange background. Um, I'm half Hungarian Protestant and half Hispanic. You know, um, I, I, I teach a course on counseling the culturally diverse. Because um, I was always interested in cultural differences, even as a kid. I remember being at family funerals where my Hispanic uncles would pick me up and they'd hug me and they'd say, it's okay to cry, it just means you love the person. You know, and then they'd put me down and my Hungarian uncles would squeeze my shoulder and say, be strong. <laughs> <laughs> so I always had this interest in cultural differences. Uh, and... Um, but, but my point is, um, what was my point? I did have a point here. Uh, um, my, oh, so I was telling you about my godson. So in Hispanic culture, we, have, we take godparenting very seriously. And when a, godparent di when a parent dies, the same-sex godparent is supposed to really take over that role. I mean, this is not symbolic. This means writing checks for college tuition. Uh, you know, you're really supposed to be a part of this kid's life. And un unfortunately, uh, his mother is half Hispanic, so she knew the rules. Uh, you know, and, and uh, 
And she came over with him like the first weekend after the funeral and said, okay, you're his godfather, let's talk about the role you're gonna have in his life. And, uh, and we talked about that. Um, and, um, and one of the rituals we had is that on his birthday, which you remember the day right after his father's death, uh, October 10th, one of the rituals we had is I'd always take him out for dinner uh, you know, just me and him, and then we would come back and there would be the, what, you know, we called the adult party. You know, the aunts and uncles, the adults, you know, not the kids anymore, but the adults. And when he was 16, I got a call from his mother. He's, he's in his 30s now. Um, and his mother called me up and said, you better be prepared. Said, Keith got his driver's permit and he's going to ask you if you can drive his car. Your choice. But just be prepared that that question's going, you know, you got to think of your answer before you get here. So I thought about it and I said, well, let, let me at least let him try. Um, so, you know, he, as soon as I pulled up, he comes running out, this 16-year-old, you know, waving his license. And he says, you know, can I drive? And I said, okay, you know. And, and of course, the secret of kids upstate is when the first kid gets a driver's license in a car, everybody else in the crowd gets driving lessons you know, uh, that nobody else knows about, you know, unofficial driving lessons. So he was driving very well for, th theoretically, his second time behind the wheel, mm -hmm, you know. And all of a sudden, I thought about his father. And I said, his father should be here. You know, this is, this is 12 years after his death. His father was a good friend of mine. And I said, he really should be here at this moment. This is a father-son movement. And I probably got a little teary-eyed, and he looked at me. And he said, I'm driving, okay. I said, no, it's not about your driving. I'm remembering your dad. And he got very quiet and a little teary-eyed. He says, I've been thinking about him all day. You know, and so we're gonna have those experiences. That's part of the grieving experience. But what can we do? Well, Bill Warden, uh, a colleague of mine, um, talks about what he calls the tasks of grief. And again, everybody does these tasks in their own way, in a very different way. And, you know, and one of which is just the role of rituals. Rituals help us accept reality. So I really do hope the, you know, the, there's a ritual for the campus community, for the alumni, in which we both celebrate and mourn. Um, acknowledge our loss and, and celebrate our legacy here, the legacy of this college. Um, and it helps to find people to talk to. Um, about it, you know, who's ever comfortable with you. Not everybody can listen, right? But there are people you can find. A second thing is to experience whatever emotions we do experience. Um, there's no need to bottle up feelings. Um, you know, you may have unfinished business. Um, I decided that the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take off the nameplate from my door and bring it home with me. <laughs> That'll be like my one reminder, you know. This was my office. Um, you know, we may have something to do. And again, you know, we may think as you think about this, what are going to be the tough times for you, you know, uh, as you deal with grief? Another thing is adjusting to a new life, you know. What's going to change? Well, for some of us on the faculty, a lot's going to change. But even for you as alumni and, and you and members of the campus community, you may still experience some sense of changes. Um, how do you deal with that change? Well, what helped you before? What strengths do you have? How can you build on them? What are your, what are your limitations? How can you avoid them? Um, how can you get support? You know, what are your sources of support? When I work with grieving people, I, 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 I use something uh, that I call DLR. You know, you all have support systems, right? Think about your support systems for a minute. Uh, when I have clients, I ask them to put, to list them, list all the people in their support system. So think of me, you know, sort of standing on your shoulder and, you know, little guy, uh, standing on your shoulder and saying, you know, uh, list your support system. And then put a D next to all the people who are good doers. Who are the people you can get to do things? I travel a lot uh, and I have a neighbor who uh, brings in my mail. I have to just tell him once, I have to shoot him an email saying, Jim, would you bring in my mail? And I know, I can bet you, that when I return on Saturday afternoon, my mail will be in a plastic bag on my kitchen table. I don't have to call him again, it's a given. Great doer. L are for listeners. Jim, by the way, is a terrible listener. Um, you know, if you tell a problem, he'll tell you five reasons why it shouldn't be a problem, three things that you should have done before the problem, and, and, and seven things you can do now. 
and you haven't even started to describe the problem. You know, <laughs> oh, that problem. Yeah, I know how to handle that. Um, so he's not a good listener. But there are people who are. And then, you know, there may be times, even as you, as you deal with your own grief, where you just need to be away from it. And these are people who are good respite people. These are people who aren't going to say to you, you know, you, the college still affecting you? You know, these are people who, what, who hope you don't talk about it. Um, but that's their strength. That's their gift. They, they allow you to do that. Um, you know, so think about what is your support. And again, you know, we always hold the bond. We always continue the bond. So, you know, think about it. We're, you know, in a sense, our life has changed by this loss. Some of us quite dramatically. Some of us less so. But whatever those changes are, uh, what do you want to take? You know, life is different now. It'll be different in August. You know, what do you want to take from your old life into your new life? What do you want to leave behind? And over time, you may say, I want to leave behind some of that anger, although some of it may be very legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. So many people. And yeah. And after you're grieving, you know you're going to need the support. But you're grieving the lack of support. Yeah. You've got to get used to that. Yeah. And, you know, and maybe the way is you have to say, where else can I find the support I found here? That's the key. Yeah. And can we retain, yeah, can we retain a sense of community um, in whatever way I can? that'll allow me to get through that. I mean, you know, um, you know I'm, a, I, I'm a very involved faculty member. Um, I love this college. I love my colleagues. Um, you know, you can testify. I'm a, you know, whenever I'm on campus, I'm at lunch. <laughs> you know, with, you know, you know with, and there's a group of us that come to lunch. And, and I love that collegial time. Um, over the summer, I look forward to it. You know, they have been a support system. I'm going to miss that. You know, some of them I'll be able to keep in touch with. Some of those may be less so. But how do we find new connections then? How do we find the support that we once got here? I think we have to remember in the midst of all the pain, both of Yeah. I mean, how blessed you are to be able to have this place to yeah. help us become who we are and to nurture us. I yeah. Mean, Yeah. And I believe that too. Uh, I'm going to close with that <laughs> in a few minutes if you're waiting. Um, but, um, but, you know, how do we continue the bond? What do I need to add? And then finally, how does our faith speak to us in moments like this? Um, you, know, and, you know, for me, the Christian paradigm of death and resurrection um, is, is one that helps me deal with all kinds of losses. And, I have to figure out how it's going to apply here, but, um, you know, and I do have a fantasy of winning the lottery and reviving the college, but I'm not sure that that's, that's a real viable one. Uh, so how do we find hope in loss? You know, when I have a grief group, uh, I always say to them, um, you know, today's what, April 9th? Yes. Okay. Um, I always say to them, you know, like, this is our last session, and, and suppose I meet you a year from now. And, and I walk up to you and I say, how are you doing? How might you answer? And it's an interesting exercise to end a grief group with because people will give you all kinds of responses, you know. Um, you know and some people will give you a, a kind of sad response. It, nothing's changed. And then you can talk about what, what, what do we need to do then. And others will say, I'd like you to meet my new spouse. <laughs> you know, so they'll have all kinds of different ways of answering that question. In many ways, I think, you know, that's a question for us to say, you know, where, where do we want to be and how do we get there? Um, you know, and, um, and, and my personal close on this, and then we can have any dialogue that you want, um, is this college has been a part of my life for um, over half of it. I'm, I came here when, I'm 30, when I was 33 years old. I'm 71 years old now. I've spent 38 of my years. Um, 30, and, and if you look at my professional life, um, I spent 30, uh, 38 out of 46 years um, here, professionally. Um, and this place has been so incredibly important to me. 
Um, I love teaching my graduate students. I'm, I'm so proud that some of them are here tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, they've been, they've been great. Um, I've loved, um, I, you know, I've been very, you know, I'd like to think I've been very productive here. Um, and, and I think I couldn't have been as productive in other places. Um, you know, so this, this college has done some great things for me, too. Um, I've developed some incredible friendships here with faculty and staff that I'm, I hope will continue. So, you know, so mixed with my grief um, is a deep sense of gratitude and, um, and a hope that somehow I can sustain some of the connections that are important to me and that mean something to me. And I hope that in many ways, you know, uh, as you deal with your grief and, and gratitude, you'll find the connections you need to continue. Um, that's all I wanted to say tonight. Um, I want to thank you for coming here. Uh, I want to thank the people who are watching as we're streaming. And I just wonder if there are any more questions, any more comments. Um, thank you for loving the college, as I loved it. I'm just wondering, as alumni, alumni, mm -hmm. is it possible for us to consider, in terms of connections, having a yearly get-together somewhere where we raise money for whatever the Earth Lines would like us to do? I think. That's a wonderful idea. The alumni board discussed about a fundraising back to the physical persistent door at the end. Am I allowed to share that? Sure. I guess you just did. We already had a meeting and we discussed trying to do some type of money. We'll be working with your own minds and we're all looking into that. So we're just going to make sure that you. Good. Yeah. That was a surprise, huh, Mildred? Yeah. <laughs> so now everybody's going to sit. Um, I just uh, one thank you all for coming here. Um, I'm extremely attached to the college as well, and the alumni association is not going away. Um, I intend to continue it. Uh, everybody who's on the board right now intends to continue and moving forward and maintaining the legacy of this college alive. So. We might not have more graduating class, but as long as there's a CNR alum alive, we will have a CNR alumni association, and we will continue to support each other as this college has taught us to support each other. May I make a recommendation, or at least a, a thought to the alumni board, that some of us who are not alumni would still like to be involved in that community? We also discussed that, too, yeah. so the faculty will be welcome. Good. Thank yeah, you. It's faculty and staff. And staff, yeah. Great. I'll look forward to hearing from you guys. Just one more thing. Everybody who's come here, please make sure that we have your most updated information and let your, your friends and families know that we need your most updated phone numbers and email addresses so that we can continue contacting you. Thank you. Anybody else? Please. So, I graduated in 1982. I'm sitting here with my roommate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, from that time, she, her, her mother graduated from this school. And this was a stable place for me. Yeah. I didn't have a stable family. This was my family. It was my family. Yeah. And I know so many of you have stories like that. And, um, and that's why it's important to continue. Please. You mentioned the 50th uh, class reunion. I know it would be hard to believe looking at us, but this would be the this year. OK. I thought you'd want to know. I do. I do. <laughs> Anybody else? Please.
Mm -hmm. I was so grateful because the classes were so late in the evening. And I just want to say thank you, Colin and Rochelle. Thank you, Dr. Dawkins. You was one of my professors. <laughs> thank you to all the faculty, the staff, and everyone because mm -hmm. this was a blessing. Thank you. I, have, I, I got my graduate's degree in uh, guidance and counseling, and I got my license. And you guys have a great relationship with the Department of, the, of State. I got my license in like two weeks. <laughs> mm, thank you. Thank you. Please. I've been getting thinking of uh, kind of like that celebration that you were saying. Um, as a recent alum, sorry, I'm trying to crack. Um, I think I always dreamed of seeing a straw fest the way that Dean Blake would always tell me they were so lively and everyone's here. And in my experience, personally, a straw fest in the four years that I was here and the year that I stayed as a staff member, I never had that experience. So I think in the celebration and doing all that, I think straw fest in a way is that opportunity for all of us to come together. It's happening this year. It's the last one. I know I'm in close contact with all the staff who are really putting in 110% to make it happen. So if all of you guys could come and share it with all of your friends, um, all of your family, and kind of make it like the biggest bang and celebration, I think that would be a really good opportunity for all of us. Thank you. I think good marketing has to happen for that as well. And there's so much with, uh, I'm class of 92, by the way. I was here on scholarship with my mom, uh, first generation college student. She said a rosary that I would go to college because after graduating from Monsignor Scanlon, I was going to work. And my mom is uh, my role model. She's uh, a good businesswoman. And uh, I, I went to the college of Rochelle here. Like I said, graduated in 92, a Bachelor of Fine Art. Great professors, Dr. Sue Canning, uh, Dr. Bill Maxwell, excellent professors, and uh, Sister Dorothy and Kelly, of course, a great wonderful mentor. And, uh, I worked here at the School of Nursing for many years during the 90s, and then I went on to get my graduate uh, certificate in Art Museum Education, and uh, I ordered pins for a straw fest, so uh, school pins, so if anyone wants to okay. stop by my little table, I'm going to have a table there if that's something that could happen. Uh, but I think getting word out, book, Facebook, something might not be on Facebook, but just put it on your web. If you yeah. want to keep the Facebook page open, that will really help. Um, take it, take a small ad out, wherever you can do it. A lot of places will do this pro bono. Put an ad in your uh, the local churches, March Mama Marinette, um, their shell, the synagogue, something that brings the community together. So they're flipping through. It's not so much bad publicity, but hey, this is the last row. That's come on out. That's what we do. Can um, are there any um, funds that have been confiscated that can be given to the alumni? Like Bernie Madoff. I was wondering what's still going on with that. I know nothing about that, so. No one's, no one's slipped me anything. <laughs> no, I'm saying maybe no. the police, no one has like the fund there that can be given back to, to the alumni? Um, I, I don't think there's any money left, really. But um, that would be a good idea to, you know, to have something for the alumni association. But I'm not sure that there is. I, I'm just out of my league right now. I don't know the answer to that. Please. Uh, with the college closing, will we be notified of uh, the events that happened and what are the consequences of uh, the individuals that you know, if the college closes, we have been getting notifications that it's going to close. Is someone going to be letting us, informing us? Brenda, I'm going to let you answer that one. I'm not sure what the question is. In other words, will, will people be updated on any legal actions and any legal consequences? What's the outcome? You know, we'll do the best we can in terms of communication. Um, we did put out a notice about the controller who could be guilty. Um, so if other things...
that. No. Please. We have an Ursuline convent down the street here, and I think we can assure you that you'd always be welcome to drop in and say hello. And that was a question people have asked. The convent will stay. That's wonderful. Okay. So you'll be a. So you guys will be a base then. That's good. Please. Because mm. I, we really need that energy. Yeah. We really need your input. We need your participation, your your communication. Because you know, I'm I'm of the mindset that I, I am angry. Don't get me wrong. I'm pissed <laughs> But I also know that that energy has to be turned into something good. And that good is keeping our legacy alive, keeping the first line legacy alive, keeping our connections to each other and our a love for each other, this place of what we learn here alive. That is the most important thing that I want to leave here with, is remaining connected to my CNR sisters and brothers. I mean, yes. I mean, you know, later. Okay. You know, and, and uncles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the faculty and staff, because they've been much a part. I was born and raised in your Michelle. I went to Isaac Young. I, I grew up walking by this place. There is nothing about this place that I don't know. I worship here. I I buried my my friends up my Ursuline friends here. I mean it's it is just unspeakable how how much is part of us. Place. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna take that energy and keep in this legacy of mine, but I hope that you all will will do the same. Please. Yes. Please. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, it's funny the things that came to mind when I found out that the, the college was closing. Uh, my mother came here. She was class of 56. And um, I think I have towards her way from had it in the closet. I thought it would be a good time to wear it. Um, but the funny thing that I thought of was when she would, she would go to reunion every year. It didn't matter. It wasn't her year. But somehow she went every year. And my, it was great for us kids because my father was in charge. And he didn't know any of the rules. <laughs> and he would make these silly um, dinners, like hash and stuff that we would never eat any other time. But it was my dad, that was what he could make. So like that was something that struck me. And of course, the relationships that I had. I mean, I was a mess when I came to this college. I left every Friday to get on that bus back to New Jersey and came in just in time to go to Dr. Ryan's 9 o'clock religion class because I was so homesick. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated, I'll never forget Sister Dorothy Ann stopping to shake my hand and said he did it because even she knew how homesick I was um, that freshman year. If anybody had the time, I would tell my whole sad story. Yeah. See how miserable I was just living 75 miles away from yeah. home. So, um, but it, it's the generational things that I'm going to miss. I met a lot of my mom's friends that grew up uh, yeah. at this college. So, and um, the reunion years and things like that. So it's it's a lot of loss. Um, but I do have one question: Is there a final date that this actually closes? Mm -hmm. no. just there's no final date. Well, well August. August. It was well, August. Yeah. August, but yeah, can we make August. it to August? Is the question. Mm -hmm. Well, I do hope that there's some big celebration. Yeah, Everybody. I think so. Please. I have a question about the Castle Gallery. It's a historic register and also the chapel. Uh, that te technically can't be touched because it's in this, what, it's, it's going to be gutted and what, changed, torn down. There has, is there a plan in place? What happens to that structure? The, the buildings become part of um, the creditors. We long after creditors, or will be long after creditors. Uh, 
Does that so mean they do what they will and just get yeah. the facade? They could take the furniture and take all the shit out of there? They will money. work with Mercy. Mercy is helping police some of the buildings. I don't have to say how it works out. It looks registered. So can I just say one thing? If, if, as, this is very sad. I share the sadness. Let me just say, every sing, every hour of every single day right now is spent with our incredible staff that's left here, partnering with Mercy to try to work out the incredible. Complexity. Complicated yeah. arrangements that have to be made first to our students who we said we want to give you the same kind of education that I had, that all of you had, or to have experience of all the faculty and staff that you've all had. And there are not specific answers on that, but we are working nonstop every single day to try to make those arrangements, to try to keep at least some of those things going so that our students that we've committed to can go to graduation, some of our faculty and staff can move forward in helping those who have to move on. And there will be more answers, but we, those are questions that I'm the chair, interim chair of the board. There are questions that we ask every single day and we are working tirelessly to try to tie up all those loose ends so that we can answer those questions at the right time. Well, I think an art historian or architecture, someone should be brought on board. There's... Well, I'm sure that there are... Well, first of all, the, the chapel is not part of that. The historic registry is for the Leon Castle. But there are issues about that that I don't even know all the well, issues. There's stained glass. There's, there's things that really should be... Having grown up all my life in the Bronx, I just think Absolutely. people got out beautiful buildings Absolutely. and places of junk. And Absolutely. And, and, I, and really I want to assure you I want to assure you that there is not a day that somebody is not thinking the same questions that you have and asking about that and trying to get answers. I, I, I assure you of that. If nobody else can, I am telling you that. It's all in the MOU, but it's up to the wind, so I don't know if that's going to be true. Well, it's not all up to the wind. I, I, we all, there, we have things we have to talk about and negotiate, things that we know that are important, that we we want to try to work out. I, I don't want everybody to think that we just say, boom, and nobody cares, because everybody does care. Everybody does care. And okay. some things, the answer will be good, and some things, I don't know. But we are trying every single day. The day starts out 8.30, 9.30 in the morning, meetings, negotiations, one person up there, things have to be worked out. Please. The chapel itself has some severe structural damage from water. It's closed since January. Some people aren't aware of that. There's, there's just like multiple layers to each thing that you're trying to deal with. It's not only the most there's, there's so much going on that, that you know, it's, it's, and such a limited staff that's available to handle all these different things. Ma'am, you had a question? Melanie? Um, class of 2006, and I'm also, um, I'm trying not to get emotional now, so yeah. I thought I had it together. Um, <laughs> also adjunct. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say, I just want to, because I'm, I'm sensing the energy is shifting and we're all very emotional, but I just want to take the opportunity to, to ref for all of us to reflect on the fact that, you know, we, we're all here together, 
as family. And with all, I, I want to say that it's an honor to have been in your class. It, it has been Thank you. a great mentor to me, Dr. Viscolio. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity. I've learned so much about myself. And I learned to heal from the trauma that I experienced growing up. And being able to pay it forward by you giving me the opportunity to go out to the, to the world and teach um, as an adjunct, I want to personally extend that gratitude to you. Thank you. I didn't think that this, you know, being trained by you, that um, <laughs> I would feel the, so much emotion, but now I feel like I'm having my own little crisis because it's like, oh my God, it's really, it's really coming to a head, but, uh, like, to a fruition that this is, this is really happening. But I want to hold that feeling and that sentiment that we started out with yeah. in terms of the journey of this gathering. So I think in terms of closure, bringing that and, and reflecting on that, I think that that's a great telling moment to, to really absorb and really, really embrace. There's gonna be a lot of change and change as someone who is not that old, thank you very much. Um, change is not, e it's not easy. Even working in a high school setting, dealing with students, changing any, in any dynamic, it, it creates discomfort. But I think part of that discomfort extends to the level of growth and maturity and, and preserving the integrity that we all came together here in this wonderful institution with wonderful staff members like uh, Professor Delta. So I want to take that opportunity to thank you all for this journey and this opportunity for, for me just to be in this room and to hear all the beautiful history that I got to hear. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we'll take one more or a couple more and then we'll, okay. yep. <laughs> Thank you. Please, do you have a hand up?
when the whole place looked gloomy with nothing but gray buildings, and I looked around and I said, wow, it's even beautiful in all this grayness. That it, I think it was my junior year that I said, because everyone loves it in the spring and yeah. the fall, but it was a gray, horrible, rainy look. And I said, this place is beautiful even in this. <laughs> And I love it, but it, it's not just the buildings in the place. It's what we had here. Yeah, yeah. Just a question for Marlene. Any sense of what will happen with the library and its grand collection? That's all being determined. And, and, you know, we're hoping that there will be students here because there's still details to be worked out. So. You know, be determined, and as soon as we know, we'll share the information. I'm not holding back anything that I know that I can't share, but it's an extremely complicated process. And well, we work every day to work forward. One more, and then I think I'm going to close. And then if you people want to stay on and talk in smaller groups, they can do so, but I want to be respectful of the time. So two more. OK. One and two. Yeah. I graduated in 2014 with my bachelor's from SNR and my master's from um, in the public administration program in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> and what hurts me more than anything is that we were like one of the original members of the MPA program. And I don't think our legacy is going to carry over to Mercy, is it? I think Mercy has an MPA program, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, what hurts me is that I can't pass the baton to my son yeah. who graduates next year. Mm -hmm. And his hopes was to come here because we live walking distance. Mm -hmm. So for me to see the school just fade away from my memory hurts me more than anything because it's a part of my community and it's a part of my memories. Mm -hmm. And I can't even give back anymore as an adjunct here because we're not in the community anymore. So I can't even tell you if I'm angry, if I'm sad. You know, I don't know how my feelings are. Just one minute I am really angry because this should not have gone to the extent that it's gone. And two, it hurts me and I'm sad because my best moments was in this college. I made wonderful friends here and I can't even pass it on to my son. So now I have to find a plan B. Mm -hmm. This was our plan A. So that you hurts can pass it on. Yeah. You can pass it on to the, your tradition, what you are, to the next kid that you be, to the to the first the to the, the students that are going to school at our side schools in the Bronx. You can pass it on. In okay. all those days, you can pass it on because what you are here, mm -hmm. service, you can pass it on. All right, I'm going to do just a few more, okay? One, <laughs> two, and three, and that's it, okay? End of time. Just because we're grief counselors doesn't mean we don't feel grief. It's not part of the deal. Yeah. Which helps. Uh, I was a class of 57. For our junior show, we had a wonderful presentation called That's the Spirit. Who's our director? That is, shows the exact feeling of our class, the classes around us. The spirit of this college was incredible. Yeah. Last comment. Uh, I think so many of the, of the comments that have been made tonight, I was blessed in 1963. And at that time, as those of you in the 50s have spoken, the Earthline presence was very, very strong and very vital. not just the tradition. And as I'm listening to people comment, I think so much of the strength and the beauty and the vitality of this place was 
a result of that influence of, of the Ursulines and their living endowment, which unfortunately we as alumni did not contribute to financially support. But there is still an opportunity, and I'd like to follow up on what a couple of people have said about Ursuline education. There's a wonderful school in New Rochelle, there's a wonderful school in the Bronx, and a wonderful school in Wilmington, high schools that are, are continuing through the Ursuline support. And that is a way that what to maintain he legacy. Said about uh, what the the uh, alumni of, of Brooklyn College of, of, of um, Brooklyn Prep have done to keep Jesuit education, maybe that could be part of it okay. for us as well to keep Thank that you. going for students. Especially well, we also have the Ursuline High Schools, not just here, but there is a whole group across the country of Ursuline. The world right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and I think, I think, um, thank you. I think there are two messages tonight, really. One is we really need to mourn our loss, but the other one is we really need to celebrate our legacy, and I think both of them came out clear in your comments. I thank you so much. You. Take care. Melanie, may I give you a hug?